Few men before him ever knew such glory. Overnight, this unknown aviator was idolized by the world. And then, just as suddenly, his fame turned to anguish. The magnificent hero became the tragic hero. His name, Charles Lindbergh, and this is his biography. I'm Mike Wallace, and this is Biography. Our story, Charles Lindbergh. And the story of Charles Lindbergh is a perfect study in the wonderful and terrible consequences of sudden fame. Young, handsome, the perfect image of a hero, he had no idea what the future held that spring night in 1927, when he finally saw the flares of a French airfield flickering beneath his plane. The future would hold frenzied worldwide adulation. And later, personal tragedy and public conflict that would scar his life forever. Charles Lindbergh grew up during the infancy of flying. Even in planes like these, which weren't built for long distance flights, the aviators of the 1920s dreamed of one great conquest, to fly the Atlantic Ocean. They tried it in every conceivable kind of airplane. There's a $25,000 prize waiting for the first man to fly nonstop from New York to Paris. And a reckless few gamble their lives on underpowered planes overloaded with gasoline. And no sooner does one attempt fail than another begins. Then, on May 12, 1927, a flimsy single-engine plane lands at Curtis Field. Charles Lindbergh, an unknown airmail pilot, declares that he will attempt the 3,600-mile flight across the ocean non-stop from New York to Paris. Lindbergh is greeted by two men who have bigger, more powerful planes ready for this same Atlantic flight. Admiral Richard Byrd and Clarence Chamberlain are waiting only for a break in the weather to begin their own flights. Against these two famous pilots, the gangling 25-year-old Lindbergh apparently doesn't stand a chance. But reporters make him the sentimental favorite. They call him the flying fool. His mother arrives from Detroit, and photographers ask him to pose kissing her. But he has a strong sense of privacy, and he refuses. He resents the glare of publicity. But publicity is inevitable for a young adventurer who will soon risk his life in the skies over the Atlantic. In the dawn hours of May 20th, 1927, Lindbergh decides to gamble on a predicted break in the weather. He has a chance now to be first to fly the Atlantic. His plane will be overloaded with gasoline. The runway is short, muddy, badly rutted. He has no way of knowing whether he can even clear the barrier of trees at the end of the field. His vision will be all but blocked by an extra fuel tank in the nose of the plane. The odds against him are staggering. But at 7.45 a.m., Charles Lindbergh has waited long enough. Turtle is behind him. Now he is alone with his plane, the sky, and the endless ocean below.
As the hours slip by, Lindbergh recalls images of the past. Of people like his father, Charles Lindbergh Sr., a strong-minded lawyer who insisted that young Charles be independent and self-reliant. He remembers lonely summers spent on a Minnesota farm, days when he would stare up at the clouds and say, if only I could fly. He recalls quitting college at 20 to realize his dream. He can still feel the excitement of sitting in an ancient jenny, ready to take his first flying lesson. He remembers thinking on that day, just five years ago, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. He thinks back to his days as a stunt pilot in 1923, his barnstorming days, when daredevil flyers risked their lives to thrill an eager public. Lindbergh remembers a little ceremony at Lambert Field as airmail service is launched between St. Louis and Chicago. Fresh from a year in the Army Air Force, he is named chief pilot of the run. St. Louis to Chicago, 262 miles. A pilot took his chances on a hop like that. Yet now, Charles Lindbergh gambles on flying across the vast Atlantic. And he is alone, the lone eagle. As he flies toward Paris, he begins to fire the imagination of the world. His flight is daring, unbelievably romantic. And a new kind of hero is born in the long, anxious hours of waiting and wondering whether he will make it. Late in the afternoon of May 21st, 1927, the drone of a plane is heard over a small fishing village on the western coast of Ireland. It is the spirit of St. Louis, and word is flashed to the waiting world. The Lone Eagle has made it across the Atlantic. At Le Bourget Airport, outside of Paris, crowds begin to gather, anxiously searching the sky. Then, shortly after 10 p.m., in 33 short hours, the boy has become a man. The man has become a legend. Static welcome continues in Paris the next morning. Wherever he appears, there are unrestrained demonstrations. To Lindbergh, it is all pleasing and bewildering and frightening. Lindbergh and the spirit of St. Louis are mobbed wherever they go. Finally, on June 4th, he starts for home. At the insistence of President Calvin Coolidge, he will return to the United States aboard the American cruiser Memphis. Lucky Lindy arrives in Washington. His mother is at his side in the triumphal parade through the nation's capital. President Calvin Coolidge awards Lindbergh the Distinguished Flying Cross and says, he is an American youth with the naturalness, the simplicity, and the poise of true greatness. Lindy rushes from Washington to receive still another thunderous welcome in New York City. Now, an entire city will make believe that Charles Lindbergh just returned from Paris, and this is his first reception. There is
is nothing make-believe about the welcome. It is the incredible spectacle of a city gone mad. Lindy starts a tour across the nation. He is acclaimed, adored in city after city. And wherever he turns, he hears his name. The fame, the glory, all are his. The world has found a perfect hero. And at this moment, the future looms ahead of him bright and shining. Apparently nothing can cloud the skies for Charles Lindbergh. In 1929, two years after his solo flight across the Atlantic, Charles Lindbergh is still the most idolized man in the world. He's America's roving ambassador of goodwill. There is no privacy for Lucky Lindy. He begins courting Anne Morrow, the daughter of the ambassador to Mexico, and the entire nation looks on. Anne is a brilliant young woman, poised and cultured. She shares Lindbergh's interests and his thirst for adventure. People say they're a perfect couple. After their marriage in May of 1929, the world becomes their playground. They cannot avoid the crowds drawn by the Lindbergh name, but in their travels, they find a few moments to relax and enjoy themselves. In 1930, the Lindberghs set a new cross-country flying record. Then they retire from the public eye to await the birth of their first child. When Charles Jr. is born, Lindbergh cherishes the child. But on the night of March 1st, 1932, their infant son is kidnapped. The kidnapping of the Lindbergh baby sets off the most intensive manhunt in history. A shocked nation is caught up in the search for the missing infant. Bits of information pour in from every part of the country, and each lead is painstakingly checked out. No story is too incredible, no possibility too slim to follow up. Then a small reward for information brings the first real break. Dr. John F. Condon is contacted by the kidnapper. Condon will act as go-between for delivering a $50,000 ransom. In a Bronx cemetery, Dr. Condon turns the money over to the kidnapper, a man who calls himself John. Condon receives only a promise that the baby will be returned. The Lindberghs wait and hope and fear. But eight weeks later, a shallow grave is discovered in a wooded area near the Lindbergh home. Their child is dead. The police are baffled. They have no clues to the identity of the kidnapper. Then, late in September of 1934, two years after the kidnapping, Charles Lindbergh must live the nightmare once again. The kidnapper has been captured. The long manhunt has ended with the arrest of a carpenter named Bruno Richard Hauptmann. The Lindbergh ransom money has been traced to him found in a tin can hidden in his garage. The Hauptmann trial opens in a carnival atmosphere. 
Hundreds of reporters and thousands of curious spectators crowd the streets around the courthouse in Flemington, New Jersey. The Lindbergh tragedy is now a public spectacle. Unparalleled press coverage reports every word of the trial and makes national figures of the judge, the attorneys, the jury, and the impassive defendant, Bruno Hauptmann. Methodically, the state builds its case against Hauptmann. The ladder used by the kidnapper is made from wood found in the Hauptmann home. Hauptmann's handwriting samples are shown to match the kidnap notes. In a hushed courtroom, Ann Lindbergh identifies the pajamas her son wore on that night almost three years ago. Then the most damning testimony of all, Dr. John Condon takes the stand. He was crouching down under the hedge, and I said, come on, stand up like a man. I have the money here. Then what I have. Then he says, wait a minute, with that V. Wait a minute. I said, all right. He got down there under the hedge, put his hand in the center of the pack, and picked out the money and said, I want to see if it's all right. John? And who is John? John is Bruno Richard Hoffman. Finally, the prosecutor, New Jersey's Attorney General David Willents, begins the cross-examination of Bruno Hauptmann. Don't lie, don't mean a thing that you do that. Stop that. Didn't you swear to untruths in the Bronx courthouse? Stop that. Didn't you swear to untruths in the courthouse? Didn't you lie on the road? Time and time again, didn't you? I did not. You did not? No. All right. When you were arrested with this Lindbergh ransom money, you had a $20 bill. Lindbergh ransom money, did they ask you what it was? Did they ask you? They did. Did you lie to them or did you tell them the truth? Did you lie to them or did you tell them the truth? I, I said nothing to them. You lied, didn't you? I did, yeah. Yeah. On February 13, 1935, the jury finds Bruno Richard Hauptmann guilty of murder and sentences him to death. After the trial, the Lindberghs and their second child, John, literally flee the United States. It is impossible, they say, to raise their son in the glare of constant publicity. In 1938, the Lindberghs accept an invitation from Hitler's government to inspect Germany's progress in aviation. In many quarters, Lindbergh's visit is interpreted as support for the Nazi cause, and in the United States, he is publicly criticized for accepting the invitation. But few people know that the trip is being made at the request of the U.S. State Department, which has asked Lindbergh to observe and report on the German buildup in air might. The striking power of the Luftwaffe, the incredible number of planes he has shown, convince Lindbergh that Hitler's air force is unbeatable, that Germany would be invincible in war. Later in the United States, Charles Lindbergh becomes a major spokesman for isolationism. He urges America to stay out of Europe's war. France has now been defeated and despite the propaganda and confusion of recent months, it is now obvious that England is losing the war. And I have been forced to the conclusion that we cannot win this war for England regardless of how much assistance we send. That is why the America First Committee has been formed. Through the summer of 1941, Lindbergh lashes out at the policies of the Roosevelt administration. His attacks become more direct more inflammatory. Are we operating under a government by representation? Or are we operating under a government by subterfuge? The hypocrisy and subterfuge that surrounds us comes out in every statement of the war party.
Leaders of both political parties, men like Wendell Wilkie, speak out against Lindbergh's charges. It does no good to say of the President of the United States, as was said last night, that he acts through hypocrisy or through subterfuge. No man President of the United States at this critical moment could act from such motives as that. But I want you to remember that we can only have one president at one time and one foreign policy at one time. Where is freedom if four-fifths of a nation can be carried to war against its will? Freedom for us does not lie on any Soviet battlefield or on any coastline of Africa or Asia. It lies today in the question of whether or not the action of our government in America is controlled by the will of our people. On December 7th, 1941, the debate abruptly ends. I ask that the Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7, 1941, a state of war has acted between the United States and the Japanese Empire. When America enters World War II, Charles Lindbergh quickly volunteers his services. As a technical consultant, he participates in the development of new bombers and new fighter planes. He insists on testing the planes himself under wartime conditions. In the South Pacific, as a civilian observer, he flies, without official sanction, in 50 combat missions. And he is unofficially credited with shooting down at least two enemy planes. In 1954, he is finally given official recognition for his wartime service. An aging Charles Lindbergh is promoted to Brigadier General in the Air Force Reserve and he is asked to head a committee that will select the site of the new Air Force Academy. Charles Lindbergh becomes an elder statesman of flying, helping to plan the future of a new generation of young pilots. The Air Force Academy symbolizes a new era in aviation, the space age. It is an age viewed with mixed feelings by the man once called the Lone Eagle. Many of us have seen with our own eyes the metamorphosis of the Wright biplanes into supersonic prototypes with close to 30 times their speed. Hurtling through the air in a jet fighter, I realize how intellectual flying has become. Now we plan huge rockets that will travel faster than a rifle's bullet for thousands of miles and we talk about flying to the moon as freely as people talked about flying from one city to another. We cannot predict with certainty what discoveries and developments the future will unroll. The new space age is creating new heroes but they'll never overshadow the Lone Eagle. He was just one courageous man at the controls of a primitive plane. But that was enough to create the legend of Charles Lindbergh. In the latter days of his life, Charles Lindbergh is an almost shadowy figure. He avoids the public scene, rarely issues public statements. He seems to want the obscurity he once had as a shy and awkward 23-year-old pilot. 
but he can never escape the fame he found back in 1927 when his spirit of St. Louis broke the barrier of transatlantic flight and made Lucky Lindy America's tragic hero. Mike Wallace for Biography.